this wonderful evening of the District 71 Growth Academy webinar masterclass series. We've got a great evening ahead of you with a wonderful guest speaker. I'm not going to talk about our wonderful guest speaker because there are other people that are going to do that and it's going to be obvious when he starts speaking. I'm Steve Campion, I am the host for this evening and I'm going to hand over to our District Growth Academy Chair, Mr Gavin Gallagher. Gavin. Many, many thanks, Stephen. <laughs> Steve, um, a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for all being here, guys. Uh, my name is Gavin Gallagher, and I am the District 71 Club Growth Academy Chair. And uh, the Academy has been established to help with training the various techniques that help clubs grow or be sustained. And um, we all we, we split our focus across a couple of areas. We're helping with, we are, we're, we're going to be helping with the formation of new clubs and all of the various skills that you need in order to kind of help grow a new club. And we're also going to be providing support to existing clubs that can often face challenges after that initial sort of burst of motivation has fizzled out and they um, maybe the club finds it difficult to kind of sustain members and things like that. So these are all areas that we hope to help uh, clubs with. And um, it's <clears throat> one of the reasons that we're doing this is because District 71 is going to be celebrating its 50th year in existence next year. And so it's a very important district. And uh, what we want to do is help ensure that it's going to have another vibrant 50 years in its history. And, uh, and we're going to do that through helping members and helping clubs through upskilling and, um, and, you know, just making sure that clubs are being future proofed in terms of their skill sets. And, you know, there's a lot of new technology out there and new platforms that we're all trying to learn. Zoom being one of them, who would have thought that we would have moved to Zoom in such huge numbers two years ago? It was kind of unheard of. And here we all are. And we're going to be doing this through arranging various trainings and, uh, and master classes like the one tonight with um, uh, you know, world-class experts and some people who are real authorities in this area. So I'm not gonna delay you guys any further. I'm gonna hand back to Steve, who's gonna introduce our next speaker, but thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Gavin, for explaining a little more about the Growth Academy. I think it's a great initiative. I now have the pleasure of introducing our district's club growth director to introduce our speaker. Please welcome Elizabeth. Thank you very much, um, host and our distinguished guest, Toastmasters, friends and everyone. It, this is a unique privilege for me to be introducing our guest speaker. I will say this once and I will say it very, very simply, but we are very, very privileged to have this distinguished um, speaker in our midst. Um, Peter Rees is a well-known marketeer, very highly respected, has experience, he's a former VP of marketing for a global publicly quoted company. He's also an academic. He's an associate, associate professor of marketing at the American University, International University in London. He's a managing director of his own consultancy company. He is an author and publisher of a free online course called Marketing for Charities. And I have to mention that that's where I came across him. I came across the course, I did it, and I was so absolutely impressed 
I put pen to paper straight away and invited him to come and speak to us. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that he accepted. In, in discussion earlier on, I was equally thrilled to hear that he's recently won the Lord Mayor's Prize. He was awarded a prize for this work and it truly is deserving of huge recognition. I, he's also a member of the Worshipful Company of Market Tours, as this spell it, the, the, these very ancient and august livery companies in London. But tonight, if you think we've got the privilege of all of that combined knowledge speaking to us in D71, and we know that we need to grow, we need to improve our number of clubs, number of, and, and we can do this, help to do this through marketing. And we have the perfect person to do this for us. So I would ask you please to put your hands together and give a very warm D71 welcome to our guest speaker, Peter Rees. Well, thank you very much for that lovely welcome. And I have to say, I'm really excited to be here with you. And thank you so much, all of you, for turning up to listen to my presentation this evening. I'll start off by going through the agenda items that I'm going to cover, which are on the next slide. And as you can see here, I'm going to start off with an introduction to my background, because I think it's always nice to understand the credentials and the qualifications of people we hear speaking to us. I'm then going to start things off quite slowly, talking about the role of marketing and the function of marketing in business. Now, I've spent, as you'll hear, a number of years working in commercial organisations, but in the past uh, 10 or 15 years, I've made a special focus of marketing for charities. So what you're going to hear today is a combination of commercial marketing concepts, but applied to the concept of charities, or in your case, not-for-profit organisations. And the talk is, after the introduction to the role of marketing, it's going to cover the broader topic of marketing planning, which today I've split into two parts, marketing planning one and marketing planning two. And in between those, about halfway through this evening, there'll be a five minute comfort break. I'll then talk at the end of this evening about the plan for the next briefing, which is gonna happen in a week or so's time and finish with some concluding remarks. As you've heard, there'll be an opportunity at various points during this presentation to answer any questions that I can, but in the interest of time, I may not be able to answer them all live in this briefing. So what I've said is if there are any questions I can't answer this evening, if Elizabeth or one of you emails them to me, I'll give you a written response. And I'll be happy to engage in conversations with any of you after you receive those. Or if there's anything else you'd like to chat about with me, speak to Elizabeth and she can give you my email address and I'm quite happy to um, interact with any of you after today's briefing. So I'm gonna start off by introducing myself and my background because I think there's nothing worse than having a speaker who doesn't do that. And in fact, recently I was at a university and in fact, I knew who the person was, but the students didn't. And this individual just came on and started talking, gave a two hour lecture without introducing themselves, their background or their credentials or their justification for being there. So I'm not gonna make that mistake. Um, the first part of my career was heavily commercial and I got over 45 years of international business experience overall. The first 26 of my career after I left university was working for IBM United Kingdom and then later on IBM Europe. I was headhunted out of IBM in 1999. I spent six and a half wonderful years working in Paris, where I was vice president of marketing for a global publicly quoted media company. And that organization had 650 newspapers and magazines and 65 websites in 22 countries. When we sold the business in 2006, I came back to the UK. And after starting my own consultancy practice, as you can see here, I've held a number of academic and uh, teaching roles. And I'm a visiting lecturer at a couple of universities and a business school. I'm a fellow and senior examiner of the Chartered Institute of Marketing. I'm a former associate professor of marketing, as Elizabeth said, and I'm a tutor and course writer for the Chartered Institute of Marketing's postgraduate marketing leadership program. In fact, I've got a new uh, role now, as well as doing all of that, I'm also now an assessor and a senior tutor for the Chartered Management Institute, where I teach courses in leadership and management. And then finally, a little bit about my involvement with charities. I've delivered, whilst being involved with the Worshipful Company of Marketors, over 250 days of marketing support and training. So what I'm giving you today is based on that experience in the real world of real marketing concepts. Um, I'm a former trustee and secretary of two charities. My hobbies include magic, composing and producing music, 
and making videos. So I hope I'm going at the right speed and I hope you can hear me clearly. Now let me move on to what I'm gonna talk about in this meeting. And I start off by admitting that I have a challenge speaking with you today. And in this briefing, I'm doing something which you're not really supposed to do as an academic, and that's talk to a mixed ability audience because I don't know, because I don't have a metro before, what your previous training and experience of marketing is. You might be not from a marketing discipline, you might be a financial person or an HR person or an admin person and have no marketing training, or you might have got a degree or a master's degree or even an MBA and be an expert in marketing. I also don't know the level of experience, whether you're new to the organisation and new to business and business management. I don't know your job level, your job function, whether you're a marketing person, market research, digital marketing, or communications. And really, today's success of today will be largely dependent on you and your engagement with the program. So what I'm trying to do is give you some practical advice which you can use in your day-to-day -day role, whether you're a marketing person or going to move into marketing for your district or for any other roles that you have in life. So I'm hoping to give you a wide range of skills which you can actually use practically. It's not just an academic theory lecture, it's real practical ways that you can use the ideas and the concepts that I'm presenting in real world situations. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the role of marketing. And I'm, I'll tell you now that I'm gonna start off slowly and accelerate this presentation as we go, but just to set the scene and put everybody in the same starting point, I'd like you to spend a few seconds thinking about how you would define the role of marketing. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass any of you and pick on any of you to answer the question, but just spend a few minutes and consider what you think is the role of marketing. Now, when I ask people this, particularly non-marketing people, I normally get five or six different answers, which are summarized on the first slide. Sometimes people think that marketing is synonymous with advertising. They say it's the same as advertising. Well, that's not strictly true. Advertising is a particularly important part of marketing. But if you think about it, advertising has been going on since the dawn of commerce. I mean, the first caveman who made wheels probably had a sign outside his cave saying that he made the best wheels in the valley. Uh, and every since, you know, commercial products, since the Industrial Revolution, people have used advertising in print or word of mouth um, to communicate the value that their products bring. And this particularly came into modern commerce in the 1950s with the rise of the big international advertising agencies in Madison Avenue in New York, a lot of whom are still active today. So advertising is a part of marketing and it fits into the area of marketing communications. Some people think that marketing is the same as selling. Now, I, when I worked for IBM for a number of years, I was an international account manager and a sales manager. And I have to say that selling is a very important contributor to marketing, but it's not the same thing. In essence, as you'll see a bit later on, marketing is about understanding and developing what customers want. Selling is about persuading them and explaining the benefits so they are inclined to buy from you rather than one of your competitors. So selling is the other side of marketing. They're two halves of the same coin, but they are different. Some people think that marketing is all about public relations. And public relations really came about with the rise of print media in about the 18th and 19th uh, century with the rise of mass-produced newspapers and magazines. And the first thing that people did in those days was to try and get news about their, their company or their organization printed by journalists and the editors of those publications. That was the rise of what we know as the press release. And that still goes on today. But of course, with the rise of digital media, a lot or most public relations activities in many areas is now conducted online through your website, through your blog, through your social media pages, or through influencers or through paid advertising. So it's still a very important part. The channels we're using have changed, but it's not the totality of marketing. Some people, particularly some of my friends who are a little bit unkind sometimes, think that marketing is all about making things like key rings and mouse mats and uh, um, wall posters and diaries. And that used to be the case in the 70s and 1980s before the rise of the internet. And some of my very unkind friends refer to marketing as the colouring in department. And to some people, it still has that reputation. It's all about branded T-shirts or golf umbrellas or baseball caps. But I'm happy to say that marketing has a more substantial contribution to make to business than just that. The third area, which has got some prominence in the news in the recent, I would say, five to 10 years, is people associate marketing with what I call the dark arts 
of persuasion and spin. And this has probably been supported by some articles we've read about in the news over the past eight to 10 years, particularly about fake news and fake public relations, particularly in some um, campaigns, electoral campaigns, both in the US and in UK and Europe. Where in fact, not only does each party accuse the other of posting fake news and lying and bending the truth, but also they are now people are now claiming that foreign governments are sometimes involved in national or international elections to try and influence um, the results to their own benefit. And I'm happy to say that this does undoubtedly go on, but it's clearly not the, pur the purpose or the role of responsible professional marketing. So one of my hobbies, I said, is magic. And I'm now going to do a bit of mind reading, because having told you all the things that marketing isn't, I bet I know what you're thinking now. What you're thinking is, well, if those aren't marketing, what is the best definition of marketing? Am I right? I think I'm right. So I'll tell you on the next slide. And there's been a number of definitions over the years, but the one I like the best is the one that comes from the professional body to which I belong, which is the Chartered Institute of Marketing. And they define marketing as the management process responsible for anticipating, identifying, and satisfying customer wants and needs profitably. And I'll just take a minute for you to um, absorb that. It makes a number of interesting points. First of all, it's all about delivering value to the customer, satisfying customer wants and needs. And that is a central theme to marketing, which is often not taught or expressed or explained very well when people talk about marketing. So I really am going to spend a lot of time returning to this point about marketing is all about satisfying customer wants and needs for most commercial businesses profitably, not necessarily the case for a charity. The other thing that is interesting there is the word anticipating. And this really demands that organizations understand what customers want and what they need, perhaps even before the customer understands it themselves. So I'll give you a couple of examples of real life situations where that has been the case. Imagine for a minute that I've transported you back to the 1980s and you're now sitting in the boardroom in Japan of the Sony Corporation. When I come in from the research and development laboratory to the boardroom, you're all directors of the Sony Corporation in the 1980s. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, I've invented a fantastic new product, which I think we should market, and you're going to love it. And now let me explain. It's a very small compact tape recorder. It's about the size of what we now see as an iPhone. It's about four inches by three inches. It's a little square box that will play cassette tapes. And you go, well, that's brilliant. That's a fantastic idea. And I say, well, there's one slight snag with this tape recorder. It doesn't actually record. It only plays cassette tapes. Now you might look at me as if I was mad at that point, but think about it. This was the basis of the Sony Walkman, which then morphed into CD players that we carry around on our belts when CDs were the media of choice. And now it's an integral part of every mobile device you see people wearing and walking around on the train in business meetings uh, and everywhere in society. Everybody now has got a mobile device, the pair of headphones in, and they're using it to play media. Who would have thought that all came about by somebody inventing a tape recorder that didn't record? If you'd ask people, do you think people buy a tape recorder that didn't record? You'd think they were mad. The other benefit for the Sony Corporation, of course, is not only does Sony make um, commercial electronics products like this Sony Walkman, but they also have a music division which signed up international music acts. So at the same time as the people in Sony invented the Sony Walkman, it also helped them shift warehouses and warehouses and warehouses of recordings by Queen and Elton John and David Bowie and all the other international artists were sewn up, so signed up with the Sony Corporation. So a brilliant example of anticipating customer wants and needs that the customers didn't really know that they wanted. The second example I'll give you, if you'll come with me now, we're going to go to North America, we're going to go to New York State, and you are now the boardroom of the 3M Corporation. 3M Corporation makes office products and office equipment and all sorts of other devices, but I, I'm now from the research and development area of Sony Corp, uh, sorry, of the 3M Corporation. I say, ladies and gentlemen, I've come up with a brilliant idea, and it's glue that doesn't stick. You look at me and think I was mad. Who on earth would buy glue that doesn't stick? Well, we all use this product every day or every week in our daily lives. It's the basis of the post-it note. The post-it note is based on repositional glue. We can now use the post-it notes to stick passwords on our computer screens 
or leave messages for ourselves or others about what we need to buy from the shopping or just notes or reminders to others. So again, a product people didn't know they wanted, but somebody anticipated that customers would love the post-it note, uh, which is based on glue that doesn't stick. So two examples there where anticipating an unmet need is a fantastic commercial opportunity. So if you're in marketing and you can ever come up with anticipating a need that customers didn't know they wanted and you satisfy that need, you will become a millionaire. And please remember, it was me who brought this to your attention. I can send you my bank account details at any point in the future. So when we're talking about meeting wants and needs, there's another concept I'll touch on briefly here, which is about exchanging value. And this was a concept developed by uh, an American academic called Professor Philip Kotler, who's very well known and very famous in the marketing community. And he talked about creating value through an exchange process. And this is something we're all very familiar with because in our society and lives, value is exchanged in a way that satisfies the wants and needs of both parties between the buyer and the seller, or in charity's case, between the giver and the receiver. And there are three models of value exchange, which you're familiar with, though you may not have thought of it in this way. The first one is at the dawn of society, the barter system, where money hadn't yet been invented, so people would trade one product for another. I've got chickens that lay loads of eggs and I'll swap them because you've got an orchard with your apples. And the first examples of commercial trade dating back about 15,000 years and beyond were based on barter, swapping one set of goods for another. With the invention of money, about 5,000 BC, we moved on to commercial exchange as we know it today, where coins and notes or other tokens were exchanged for physical goods. You're giving us small pieces of metal or small pieces of plasticized paper to people, and they're giving you a bicycle in return because they have a belief in the value that that, that note or that coin represents. And that's the normal commercial transactions, which were the basis of everything that we did before COVID, which now is all based on digital and credit card transactions. But for charities, there's a third one, which is the charity exchange model, where normally speaking, and I'm talking not necessarily about you guys, but a pure charity gives its products or services at no charge to the beneficiary, no charge to the recipient. So here's an example of a charity, perhaps it's making cancer drugs or something to treat childhood illness or something to treat any other malaise. And it's being given to patients, often in markets or often in situations where it is free to the patient. And often the case where the patient hasn't actually asked for that particular product from that particular charity. Where, we've, where we in society find there's a need or a want in another part of the world, we will, the charities will mobilize resources and have them directed to satisfy, satisfy that requirement, perhaps with a drought or a famine or a natural disaster, and give benefit to people who didn't ask for it, weren't expecting it, and actually aren't paying for it. And that, I think, is the magic of the charity segment, which is why I'm so interested in working with it. It's an absolute magic and fantastically wholesome and valuable business model. So that's the exchange of value process. So as a result, about um, eight or no, eight years ago, yeah, I invented another definition of marketing. I did, modified the Chartered Institute definition. And based on what I've just told you, I'm saying that charity marketing is the management process of anticipating, identifying and satisfying beneficiaries, donors and other stakeholders wants and needs with an exchange of value between all the parties involved. Because as I've just explained, charities don't usually sell their services to the recipients of the charity. So that's just my definition of charity marketing, which I have to say seems to have got some traction in the academic and business world since I wrote it eight years ago. So when I'm called in to do work with charities, and as I said in my introduction, I've done over 200 and 220 free days of charity advice over the past 10 or 15 years working with my livery company, what people normally ask me to do is come in and give them advice on some of these areas listed on the left-hand side of this slide. They want advice on communications or designing their website or explaining how to use digital media properly. And you can see service development, how they can recruit more donors, how they can increase their income with corporate sponsorship or individual sponsorship or right marketing collateral brochures or not so much mouse maps and key rings anymore, but sometimes brochure and literature. And I've done all of those things in copywriting. So I've done all of the things on the left there for various charities, national and international over the past 10 or 15 years. 
But it has occurred to me over that time that what people would really benefit from was not somebody coming in just doing a piecemeal fix to one of these little individual areas, important though they are, to get the most benefit out of the value that marketing can really create for you, you need to step back and take a more holistic view. So what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this briefing and the second briefing in some days time is the whole concept of marketing planning. And if you understand marketing planning, then by definition, you will be covering all the things on the left because they're all part of the overall process. So my aims in these two briefings that I'm going to deliver for you are to provide to you the necessary knowledge and skills to enable you to develop a marketing plan. Now, that might be a marketing plan for your district of Toastmasters. It might be a marketing plan for any other charity with which you work, or it might be a marketing plan that you can use in any other commercial or charity organization with which you're involved in your day-to-day -day job. And what I'm gonna try and do is make it interesting and practical, because although I'm gonna talk about some academic theories and models during all of this, I'm going to show you how to apply them in a very practical, pragmatic way that will actually add value to you rather than just do some wafty narrative academic philosophical presentation of those. So I hope that meets with your approval. So I'm going to start off as I talk about marketing planning, and I'm going to speed up a little bit now as we've got a lot to go through and talk about what I call marketing's best kept secret. And this is something that used to drive me crazy. When I first studied started studying marketing in a really applied and practical sense about 25 years ago, I started getting my qualifications in marketing and working full-time in marketing roles in various companies. Marketing's best kept secret is the following. There is no correct way to write a marketing plan. And it took me a while to understand why this is. And it sort of drove me crazy because when I started studying marketing, I'd read a book on marketing planning. It would give you a method or a process for marketing planning. And I'd understand it and I'd start using it. And then in a month or six weeks or two months later, I'd read another book on marketing planning and it would tell me to do it a different way. And a third book and a fourth book and a fifth book. And it took me some time to realize that the, essentially they were telling me to do the same things but it was based on the narrative and the history and background and experience of the author of those books. So if, for example, you read a, a marketing planning book by a famous American academic called Professor Michael Porter, his background is in large American corporations selling cars and washing machines and FMCG goods. And his background is an economist. So he's writing his marketing plans from the viewpoint of an economist dealing with large American multinational corporations selling fast moving consumer goods. If you read any marketing plans by my friend, Professor Malcolm McDonald, he's a noted academic from Cranfield Business School, plus another six or seven other universities. He's written 47 books on marketing and his background was originally, he was the marketing director of Cadbury Schweppes. So his marketing plans are very uh, financially based and very suitable for food and drink manufacturers, such as the Cadbury Schweppes group, and so on and so on. So different authors have different approaches to marketing planning, but they all actually tell you the same thing. If you can dig beneath the surface a little bit, they'll all tell you the same thing. And so marketing is a bit like marketing is like planning a fruitcake. And before you think I've taken leave of my senses, let me explain why I tell you this. If I asked any of you to please give me a recipe for a fruitcake, you'd either know it because you have to know a fruitcake recipe or within a few minutes or an hour or two, you could come up with a recipe for a fruitcake. You could phone a friend, you could go 50-50, you could look on the internet, you could look in a cookery book if you happen to have one in your home and you would come up with a fruitcake recipe. And all of you would propose a recipe that contained the same basic ingredients, milk, flour, eggs, sugar, um, fruit and various spices and all of you could I'm sure make a jolly delicious fruit cake but they'd all be slightly different because the proportion of the different ingredients would be slightly different and how long you mixed it and how long you baked it I've turned into Mary Berry haven't I how long you mixed it and how long you baked it and what spices and extra herbs and flavorings you put in it would make each of your fruit cakes different but they'd all be recognizable as a fruit cake and marketing plans have the same basic recipe so every marketing plan has these following four elements, which I shall explain in a minute. There's a box there that's outside the traditional marketing plan, and this is the mission or the purpose of the not-for-profit organization or in a commercial organization, it's the vision and mission statement 
of that commercial organization. And I've taken these out of the basic recipe because they're normally formulated in a commercial company by the board of directors and in a charity or not-for-profit organization by the uh, trustees or again, the management team. So mission and purpose directs the marketing plan, but it's not strictly speaking part of it. So marketing plan has four parts, analysis, decision, implementation, and control. And that is the underlying recipe. Whosever book you read, it's analysis, decision, implementation, control. Maybe with different words, but that is the basis of every marketing plan. Now, I'll just tell you something as an aside here. This is a very useful framework because it only occurred to me about three or four years ago that actually this is a good basis for almost every presentation or PowerPoint you will ever have to write. If your boss says, right, okay, can you write a presentation on how we can recruit more members for district, your district of Toastmasters? Or can you do a marketing plan for launching a new product? Or can you do a plan for some market research? It would probably go through the four steps, analyzing where are we today, deciding what you're gonna do about it, implementation plan, who does what, when, what dates, what resources, what budget we need, and how are we going to measure the outcome? So that is a fundamental basis of all marketing plans, and I just offer it to you as a tip for writing PowerPoint. So this evening, ladies and gentlemen, you're not only getting advice on marketing planning, you're also getting best practice tips on how to make super duper PowerPoint presentations at no extra charge. Now on that point, I'll just make another aside here. I'm sure most of you do PowerPoint presentations, but do you know what, how I'm doing this? And do you know how I'm doing this? Why do you care? Well, I'm telling you why. What to make the screen go right, you hit Shift and W and the screen will go white and you hit Shift and W again, it will come back. And the reason I show you this, if I was doing this in a real face-to-face -face presentation and somebody put their hand up and asked a question, I'd say, okay, John, what's your question? And while you're telling me your question and while you're answering, I'll turn off the screen so people aren't distracted. So I'm now standing in front of a white screen. I answer John's question, check with John if I answered your question. He says, yes, Peter, that's an absolutely brilliant answer. I say, thank you, John. I shall proceed with my presentation and do shift W and turn the screen back on again. The other place you can use this is with the shift and B key, because when you're coming up to do a presentation, you have your slide loaded at the front page, full screen, and then do shift B and it makes the screen black. You're standing in the wings. The audience is hushed with excitement. Your name is introduced as the guest speaker for the evening. You walk on the stage, the spotlight's on you, the applause is thunderous, and you say, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, I'll start my presentation. And you just hit shift B, and it comes onto the opening screen without all this faffing about, and, oh, hang on, I can't remember, and the memory stick's not gone in. It just makes you look more professional. So another PowerPoint tip, again, at no extra charge. So moving on, let me now introduce you to a friend of mine. And this is, gentleman is a guy called Paul Smith, known as PR Smith. And he's a noted academic, his friend of mine is an academic, an author, a publisher, and a business consultant. And when he did his MBA, he found exactly the same problems that I did, and it drove him crazy as well. And what he did is he took the recipe that I've just showed you, analysis, decision, implementation, and control, and he invented an even better cake recipe. And what I'm going to show you now, what I'm going to use is Paul Smith's slightly enhanced analysis, decision, implementation recipe, which I shall be talking about for the rest of this evening and in the next presentation. So let me explain that to you now. So Paul Smith came up with a recipe, a marketing planning recipe called SOSTAC. And as you can probably guess, SOSTAC is an acronym, and I'll explain what the acronym stands for. The first S of SOSTAC stands for situation, and this answers one of six business questions. The situation is, where are we today? Because unless you identify the start of your marketing journey, you can't really navigate anywhere in the future. So I'm gonna talk about how we do a situation analysis in today's briefing. The second part of left of SOSTAC is O for objectives, which defines the endpoint of our journey, which is where are we going? The second S stands for strategy, which is how we will get there. Then you've got tactics, which way is best. Actions is who does what when, and control is how do we ensure safe arrival. So those are the six parts of a SOSTAC marketing plan. And today I'm gonna to cover situation, objectives, and the first half of strategy. And that's what I'm gonna do in the rest of this evening's presentation. And then in the second briefing, I'm gonna do the second half of strategy and then round out with tactics, actions, and control. So that's my objective. So putting it all together, 
we had the SOSTAC, uh, sorry, we had the analysis, decision, implementation, and control model. Then my friend Paul Smith came up with the SOSTAC recipe, which fits in like this. So basically, what he's done is expanded the decision part into objectives and strategy, and has expanded the implementation part. So he's using the same framework as on the left, but he's just filled out some of the steps. And that is the model that I commend to you. And that is the model I, I recommend if you want to get into marketing planning in a professional and efficient way to remember and use the steps in a SOSTAC model, situation objectives, strategy, tactics, actions, and control. Are there any questions? I can probably pause for one or two questions here if anybody has any, we, otherwise I shall press on. So um, my speaker minder, my speaker guardian, are there any questions so far? Peter, so far we have had a question about whether the slides will be shared, yep. which I've answered that we are recording this session for the benefit Absolutely. of those that either can't make it or will right. need to view it again in the future. Okay, I I'll also mention here, and I'll say it again later on, the briefings that I'm doing today and the second one I'm doing for you are based on the free marketing charity marketing course that I wrote during the COVID time. So what I produced in that context was 15 video lessons, which together make eight hours of training. So what you're seeing today and in the next briefing for you is like an executive summary of that whole course. So this is being recorded. I'm happy to share the slides for this, but if you want to see, if you want to get into this more deeply, then you have available to you a free eight hours of training, 15 video lessons, which make eight hours of training, which cover all of this stuff in a lot more depth than I'm able to cover in an hour and a half today and an hour and a half next time, okay? Thank you, Peter. I, I didn't, there weren't any other questions I received yet. Okay, that's great. Hopefully it's because people haven't nodded off and they're enjoying it. We shall find out later, no doubt. So let's move on. And I'm going to now move on to the first part of this SOSTAC model and talk a little bit about the situation analysis. And this is all based on the first concept, which a lot of people are familiar with, which is market research. So again, because I have a mixed ability audience, I do apologize if the things I'm saying to you today are very basic and you know it already. But for some of you, I hope it will be new news or a different way of expressing things, which will give you some value and some understanding. So let me quickly go through some basic theory about market research, and then I'll talk about some practical ways you can apply it and some practical ways you can apply it in the context of your own organization or any other organization you wish to help with their marketing. So the first thing is there's two sorts of market research, this deductive and inductive market research. And deductive market research is where you start with a thought or a statement or a question, and then you do to research to see if it's true or to what extent it is true. So for example, I could say, I believe that men use Facebook more than female consumers and females predominantly use the Instagram social media platform. And I could do research that answers that question. And I could say, yes, it's true or it's not true. Or if it's a more complex question, I can use statistics to say the percentage probability of it being true. So deductive research is you start with a question or a thought and you use research to see if you're right or not. The second one is inductive research, where you just observe loads of things and you do a survey or a questionnaire or interviews, and then you see what you can learn from the answer. So you, you extract a theory from the collection of data that you've done in your inductive research. So those are the two broad approaches, and I hope you can see the difference between them. The second two categories of market research are the sorts of data that you collect. This quantitative research, and as the name suggests, this is all about quantities or numbers, and it's all about numbers and statistics and facts and figures. And you probably had research where people have asked you to rate things on a scale of one to 10 or to say, put things in order. And that's quantitative research. You're extracting numeric data from the information you receive from your, from your target uh, people you're surveying. Qualitative research is more subjective. It's about attitudes and feelings and opinions and emotion. And both these are very valuable approaches. They can tell you different sorts of things about whatever you're researching, either in numeric form or in qualitative, subjective, thoughts, emotions, feelings, uh, and that sort of thing. The second two sorts of market research are called primary research and secondary research. And I'll just quickly touch on those. Uh, primary research is research that you do or your organization does or you pay a research company to do just for your own purposes. 
It could be inductive or deductive. It could be quantitative or qualitative, but it's just for your own organization or your own purposes, and you're not going to share it with anybody else. Secondary research is, if you like, publicly available information from external resources. So it could be reports that are published on the internet. There's various agencies that study different market sectors. There's fashion research companies and industrial research companies and retail research companies, and they publish regular industry reports, if you like, about the state of the nation for that industry sector. So you have a choice. You can pay for research to be done for your own purposes, or you can use freely available or publicly available research that's shared between lots of people. Sometimes it's by government, sometimes it's by an industry sector, sometimes it's by the charities commission or charities websites. So there's publicly available research as well, which is usually delivered for no cost. As far as research tools, and I guess this is most of our experience of research is when we have to get involved in one of these. And I've both been a recipient and a commissioner of all this sorts of research. Sampling is simply counting occurrences of things. So you can sample shopping products. You can go to a supermarket and see what they're charging for different products. You can do mystery shopping. You can buy a load of clothing or drinks or crisps or motor cars and take them to bits and see how they're made. You can sample products, you can sample services, you can sample opinion. Then there's questionnaires, which are normally qualitative research where you're asking people's opinion. What's your, what's your feelings about uh, public speaking? Um, how much do you like public speaking? How valuable would it be if it could help you to overcome your fears of public speaking? What's your, what are, put these fears in order, spiders, death, drowning, public speaking, or small spaces? And you could do questionnaires like that. Interviews are typically one-to-one, -one, and before COVID, they were usually done face-to-face, -face, but nowadays is a quite a large segment of market research companies that are doing them by Zoom or similar method. We are, you're interviewing people face-to-face -face on Zoom or some other platform, and you're asking them either questionnaires, qualitative or quantitative. There's focus groups where you're talking to a group of people in the same way. And then there's observation. You could just sit in a, in a retail, say you're the marketing manager for Selfridges department store. You could sit and observe how many people come into the store, what's their typically route through, how many people go to the Gucci section, how many people go to the Prada section. You can look at the till receipts and see how much people are spending, how much time they're spending on store. And you can just observe people's behavior by watching them and making notes. You can write case studies. So if you wanted to find out, for example, what the Rotarians are doing, you could do a case study about the Rotary organization if you believe, for example, that possibly was one of your competitors, to take an example. And you could find out publicly available information about them. You could search their website. You could look at their company reports. You could speak to members. You could speak to, you could apply to join and see how they treat you. And you can do lots of research on your competition by applying to join them or joining them and seeing how they treat you. And then finally, there are surveys, which are just questionnaires, mostly numeric. And those are the research tools with which most people are fairly familiar in a lot of them. One thing I'll just say about surveys, though, and this is something that constantly amazes me, both when I deal with commercial organizations or charities or my students, whether they're undergraduates or my master's students, when they decide that they're going to do a survey, and I'm going to make some fairly dismissive comments here, and I'm not being rude about you guys, because I don't know whether you've done surveys or not, and I don't know how well you've done them, but just let me point out three mistakes that people often make. And this is particularly true of charities, uh, because they often have less marketing expertise than commercial organizations, and certainly from my students. The first thing is they design a survey but it's not actually clear, so they haven't thought out, what are you trying to find out? And you can tell if somebody's done this, if the first three questions of a survey are about your gender, your age, and let's say your income or your education level, it's almost certain that you haven't thought about what you're trying to find out. And the reason I say that, if you think about it, if you send out a survey form to 100 people, and the first question you ask them is their age band, and you'll get a survey, the results back and you can produce a nice little pie chart, and it says 20% of the people were between 20 and 40, 40% of the people were between 40 and 60, and 40% of the people were between 60 and 80. Well, that's terrific. But that's solely dependent on the people you sent it to. If you sent it to a different 100 people, you'd get a different pie chart. If you sent it to a different 100 people, you get another pie chart. So that in itself, in isolation, is of no value. So it simply just tells you a pointless piece of information, which is the age range of the people you just randomly have to survey. 
So it's only good to do demographic, demographic information if you link it to something else. So if later on, having to establish somebody's age, if you then find out what social media they use, and you can find out what social media is prevalent and useful among different age bands, then it does become useful. The second thing is people sometimes choose the wrong research tool and they decide to do online or offline or a focus group or one-to-one, -one, and they haven't really thought out the strengths and weaknesses of each particular technique. And I haven't got time today, but of course you can appreciate there are strengths and weaknesses in some areas where you wouldn't use a survey and some areas where you absolutely would. The second thing is they haven't thought about how they're going to analyze the results. Let's say they've got another company I'm consulting for. They've just done an international survey in four countries and they've got 2,700 research sheets back in. And now they're wondering how they're going to analyze it because the way they built it, it's not easy to put it into Excel or to SPSS or some other analytical tool. And finally, if they got all those three areas right, they haven't thought with what are they going to do as a result. Now, these sound like four stupid things to say. What are you trying to find out? Which research technique are you going to use? How will you analyze the results? And what will you do as a result? Believe me, in my experience, many organizations that do market research have got at least one of those questions not thought about when they start doing and paying for the work to be done. So let me just share with you two quick win approaches. The first one is a good tool for primary research, and some of you may know about this, but there's a free digital online tool called SurveyMonkey that allows you to write online surveys, um, send them out electronically, and then SurveyMonkey provides the tools and techniques to analyze the results. The second one is a great way to get secondary research, and it's a thing called Google Alerts. So again, apologize if all of you know about Google Alerts. If you don't, that's a picture of what it looks like. If you Google the phrase Google Alerts, you get to this page and it allows you to set up an alert about a particular topic. So here you can see, I've said, I want to know about the British Red Cross and I want to have information about the British Red Cross once a day and I want it in English and I want it to come from any region of the world. And I can set up this alert and I'll say, I hit create the alert button at the bottom and it will send that to Peter Reese. So now, it's a, because I've set up the alert like that, I'll get a daily email from Google for free. I'll get a daily email with the links to the top 20 or 30 places in English on the internet from anywhere in the world where there was some article or mention of the British Red Cross, some news, some article, some commentary, or the British Red Cross itself does something. And you can set up Google Alerts for your company, for your organization, for your district, for all the other districts, for your competitors, for a particular industry sector, for academics, whatever, any topic, you can set up a Google alert and you'll get a free alert and you can choose to have it delivered to you daily or on a weekly basis. And it's an absolutely brilliant tool. And if you haven't done this, you can also set up a Google alert for your own name. And you can see if you appear in the news anywhere on the internet, which can be jolly entertaining. Right, so these are the common sort of research projects that I've seen. And again, I haven't got time to go into all of these in detail. Uh, market, shareholder stakeholder satisfaction survey market perception of the organization and you can read those for yourself so that's just to give you some examples of the sorts of things that people i've been involved with in charities have done in actual real market research projects just to give you a sort of a starting point i'll talk now about customer satisfaction because it is a demonstrable fact that the biggest influence on business growth and success is customer satisfaction. Happy customers buy more, spend more, stay longer and tell their friends about it. So I'm going to give you a tool now of how to measure customer satisfaction with a single question and a single methodology. And it's called Net Promoter Score, which was invented by an American consulting company. And basically you ask people to rate something on a scale of one to, of naught to 10. So here's an axis you say, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is terrible and 10 is wonderful, how do you rate your experience of Toastmasters district, your district? And they rate you on a scale of 0 to 10. And what you do, you analyze what percentage of the people rated you as a 9 or a 10, and they're called promoters. And they're likely to stay with you, they like you, they'll tell their friends, and they're likely to maintain a loyal customer. There's a group of people who rate you seven or eight and they're called passives and they're fairly neutral you know they're having an all right time they don't think you're wonderful but they don't think you're terrible and they're the passives people who rate you seven and eight and then there's a big red box called detractors 
and those are people who give you a score between naught and six. And they're not happy, they can be very unhappy if they're giving you a naught, one or two, and they're likely to migrate, they're likely to go somewhere else. If they really, if you really upset them and they really don't like you, they can damage your brand by talking about it negatively and they can impede the growth through negative word of mouth. So just ask whoever you want to survey, it doesn't have to be, we can keep personalizing it to Toastmasters. Let's say you wanted people's opinion of a particular motor car, a particular brand of chocolate, or a particular type of cornflakes. On a scale of naught to 10, how wonderful do you think of Kellogg's cornflakes? You count up all the answers and the net promoter score, you take the percentage of respondents who are promoters, so the percentage of people who gave you a nine or a 10, and take away the percentage of people who gave you a score of naught to six. And the arithmetic answer is the net promoter score. So you can, you can understand customer satisfaction in one question with one set of numbers, and it's that easy to do. And this is an absolute brilliant technique for people who are starting out measuring customer satisfaction. If you sent out an email to all your members saying, on a scale of naught to 10, how happy are you with the experience that Toastmasters district, your district is delivering? And they'd all rate you from naught to 10, and very quickly you could calculate your net promoter score and then do a survey in three months or six months or nine months and see how it's changing. So I just commend that to you as a brilliant way of working out customer satisfaction or with a single question. Any questions? I'm just after this, I'll just tell you I've got one more section to go and then we'll have the break. So any questions so far? Nothing so far, Peter. Okay. Could, could I throw could I throw one in, Steve? Or, um, the, when they're talking about the net detractor um or the net the net um detractor score or the net promoter score. Um, if that's smaller than the net detractors, how do you deal with that? Well, you, if you take the percentage of green, if you take the percentage of red away from the percentage of green, you can get a positive or a negative number. If 90% of people say you're um, green and 10% give you a red score, your net promoter score is 90 minus 10, which is 80. So that's your net promoter score, 80. If, on the other hand... 10% um, of your people gave you a green score and 90% of them gave you a red score, it's 10 minus 90 is minus 80, in which case your net promoter score is minus 80. It's just pure arithmetic. So you have a problem there, it, it's a major problem. Yeah, you, you could say that, and 90% of the people don't like you. Yeah. <laughs> it's not good. No, I mean, I, I'm thinking in terms of you were saying where they will... Um, you know, the, the promoters will refer people, et cetera, et cetera, where the detractors will uh, put around negative thoughts about you. Absolutely. So, so you're in serious trouble if you're in a net, if you're in a, a minus uh, situation there. You absolutely nailed it. That's completely yeah. right. Thanks, Peter. Just wanted to... Okay. Yeah. It's a brilliant technique. I recommend it. So what I'll do then, I'll press on to, in the interest of time and talk about situation analysis. So situation analysis, I'm going to introduce three Greeks to you. And there's three Greeks called macro, meso, and micro. And they represent the three levels at which you can do a market analysis. And the first one are macro factors, because macro is the Greek for big. And macro factors affect all organizations and all business sectors. And I'll just explain the three levels, and then I'll go through and show you a model for each one. So there's macro factors that affect everybody. There's meso factors that affect just one sector. And then there's micro factors that affect just one charity or one organization. So macro, meso, and micro are three Greek words. Macro means big, micro means small, and as you can guess, meso means intermediate or medium size. So for no extra money, not only are you getting marketing advice from me and PowerPoint presentation tips, I'm also teaching you ancient Greek at no extra cost. So let's look at the first model. In order to do a macro analysis, we use an acronym called STEEPLE, which stands for Sociocultural, Technological, Economic, Environmental, Political, Legal, and Ethical. And what I would invite you to do is think about how each of those factors could affect your business in the next six to 12 months. What sociocultural factors could affect your business? It might be to do with schools opening and closing, universities opening and closing, more people having time at home because of COVID. What technological changes, what economic changes, environmental, and so on. So I'll explain later on. So you need to put some people in place to start thinking about this because these are factors that affect everybody in the world. 
and they affect Toastmasters in your district. So what are you going to do about it? Start putting plans in place to think how you'll cope with these things. The second level of factors is called MISO factors, and these affect just one industry sector. And here we use a model called Porter's Five Forces. And you have to consider five things. And this is about who's got the power in your industry sector. So who are your competitors? How big and how important are they? Who are your customers? And do they have a lot of choice? Are they coming to you because they particularly want to learn public speaking? Or are they coming to you because they want to engage in some social organization that has you know, nice events and nice membership and nice people to talk to? In which case they could use you or the Rotary Club or another charity or you know, a local organization in their community. What suppliers do you need? Do you need speakers and are there other people who the speakers could go to rather than you? What other suppliers do you need? Could anybody else come in into your and start offering um, social activities based around public speaking and take some of your market share away from you? And could people do it another way? So the substitute we're seeing here was how the internet really replaced a lot of high street shops. So over the past 20 years, the arrival of the internet changed the way people do shopping, which made Amazon now the largest retailer on the planet, and Jeff Bezos, the chairman of Amazon, the richest man on the planet. And my piece of advice is, watch out when Amazon start buying supermarket chains. Because once Amazon owns supermarkets like um, Ocean, Carrefour in Europe, or Tesco, or Marks and Spencers, or Sainsbury in England, or Walmart in the States, then they're going to be quite a powerful force in society. Finally, there's this analysis and it's called a SWOT analysis. And some of you will probably have known about this and I'm sure many of you already have done it. And I guarantee that you've done it incorrectly because you learned it incorrectly and it's just a constant source of despair to me how badly it's taught. So for those of you who don't know it, a micro analysis about one organization is based on what's called a SWOT analysis. And what you do is you draw across like this and you fill in the four sections on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that your company faces or your organization faces. And this is how it's taught by every professor and every business school and every course and every textbook, and it's awful. Because one of the things they forget to tell you, first of all, is that strengths and weaknesses should be internal and opportunities and threats are external. And that's often missed out in all of this training and people go disastrously wrong. Even if they tell you that, and if I invited you to do a swap now, and you've done it before, I guarantee I can predict through my power of my mind what you're going to say. And you're going to say this, because everybody does. And this is the same SWOT analysis that I would see from Toastmasters, from British Airways, from Tesco's, from Marks and Spencer's, and it is of no value. It is pointless and useless. And if this was given to me by a student, I would give it no marks. Now, I say that to my students and their face goes white and the blood drains from their head because they think, well, blimey, that's how I was taught. What's wrong with it, Peter? So I shall tell you what's wrong with it. Those factors there are so blindingly obvious and pointless that they add any no value. Saying a threat is competition is hardly a surprise. Saying COVID is a threat, well, yes, but so what? Saying an opportunity is, well, we can develop new services. That's an opportunity. Well, yes, it's blindingly obvious, it's pointless, it's of no value. It's bland, it's vanilla, it is of no value. Don't do a SWOT like this. How you should do a SWOT is like this. First of all, make sure you follow the strengths and weaknesses internal and the opportunities and threats are external. To do a SWOT, you don't just have to do a cross on a page with little bullet points. Even though everybody teaches you to do that, it's rubbish. Do a SWOT analysis by writing paragraphs of text about the strengths, weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats. Make them specific and explain what it actually means to your organization. And also you need to do one for each business unit. So for example, Marks and Spencer's sells food, ladies clothes, men's clothes, children's clothes and home furnishings. Therefore, if I was consulting to Marks and Spencer's, I'd tell them they need to do five SWOTs. They need to do a SWOT for food, a SWOT for ladies clothes, men's clothes, children's clothes and home furnishing because in each market, they've got different products, different competition, and different customer sets. And that's the end of my rant about SWOT analysis. So to finish off this section before the break, I would say, having understood the situation analysis and the background of market research, the practical action point I recommend to you is get you and your team, if you want to use my marketing planning advice, and prepare a situation analysis using a macro steeple, MISO, Porter's Five Forces, and a micro SWOT analysis for your organization. 
And that would be the first step of your marketing plan that I'm suggesting you build. This should be updated once a year and perhaps with an interim review halfway through the year. And you can split the task between different members or different departments of Toastmasters for your district. What I'm going to talk about now quickly is objectives. And objectives is the second step of the SOSTEC model, which answers the question where we're going. Because if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, as Lewis Carroll said in Alice in Wonderland. So it's very important to set objectives. Now, I'm sure you do in your organisation because Elizabeth has told me some of the business numbers that you're going after. But I'm just mentioning it here because in many cases, charities are very bad at this and they don't do this at all very well. So just let me quickly remind you about the difference between aims and objectives and how each one is used. Everybody uses these four terms in business, aims, objectives, goals, and targets. And the problem is that people mix them up, particularly my students and some of the smaller charities that I work with. Aims are narrative descriptions of qualitative statement of what you wish to achieve. They're perfectly valid to put in a business plan, but they are not the same thing as objectives. Objectives are numeric quantitative, and they're a single focus statement about what you wish to achieve. They often start with the word to, and they describe what success looks like. So they're numeric, quantifiable, and define success. If I meet all, the, if I achieve all these objectives, I've been successful. Targets, oh, sorry, goals are the same as objectives. So I'm not going to use them. I don't use them when I'm teaching. And targets are the place that an objective takes you to. So for example, if you said a perfectly valid objective is to increase your client membership by 5%, the target is the number that that represents. It's because just increasing by 5%, it wouldn't tell me, for example, what number you were going after. The target is where that objective takes you. One thing that people do particularly badly in the smaller charities and in some companies I work with is they don't have smart objectives. And objectives should all have the following characteristics. They should be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bounded. And just as my advice to you, every objective that you see and every objective you set should have all of those characteristics. And people often, my students often write about the SMART model and they describe it in great detail and they give me loads of objectives which are not SMART in some, many, or occasionally any respect. So make sure your objectives are SMART. And I'll give you a quick quiz here, which I'm not asking you to answer in the interest of time. I'll tell you what the answers are. The first question, is to improve the charitable brand image and engagement with its members, is that a smart objective? So have a think to yourself if the answers are between yes or no. And I'll tell you now, no, that is not a smart objective. It's an aim. There's no number in it. It's qualitative. It's descriptive. It's perfectly valid. That might be what you aim to do this year, but it is not an objective. Is this an objective? To recruit at least 10 new volunteers in each quarter in 2021, by increasing the number of visitors to the volunteer section of the website to at least 100 unique monthly visitors within three months. Is that a smart objective? Well, that's a bit of a trick question. It's not a smart objective, it is in fact two. And I said that smart objectives should focus on just one thing. So the first smart objective there is to recruit at least 10 new volunteers in each quarter in 2021. The second objective is increasing the number of visitors and volunteer section of the website by 100 in three months. There's two separate objectives. If you split it in two and measure them separately, you can achieve one and not the other. So don't put an objective with multiple things in it because you'll be very hard to decide whether you've achieved it or not because it consists of two things. And thirdly, this one, to increase the awareness of our charity by 10% during the planned uh, communications campaign in the second half of 2021. That's not smart for several reasons. It's not specific because you don't say what you mean by awareness. And I've asked all of you to tell me what you thought awareness was. I guarantee I'd get at least 10 different answers. So it's not specific. You haven't said whose awareness you're trying to raise. Is it awareness of existing members, potential members, uh, or people who work with your competitors? And it's not easy to measure because in order to measure awareness, it's gonna be quite expensive and you need to survey probably over a thousand people. So it's quite expensive. So it fails on two reasons of specificity and also it's not measurable. I'll very quickly spin through this. I know I've got a finance person in the room, so I don't want to be rude, but this is another area where people are quite poor, not saying in Toastmasters, but in some commercial organizations in charities. The first method that people often use for setting a budget for marketing is the competitive parity. 
they try and work out what their competitors are doing and spend the same amount of money. You can often get that from annual report, the reports, the percentage of revenue spent on marketing. Supermarkets is 15%, fashion businesses, it's 30%. So you can often find out what your competitors are spending on their marketing from their annual report. But if you copy them, if you do competitive paratry, you'll just be the same as them. And you don't, they might be have a different stage of their growth. They might be trying to do recruitment where you're trying to do retention. They might have just divested of a part of their business and got some income. They might have less budget or more budget than you. So trying to copy your competition means that at best you'll achieve mediocrity. You'll be average. And really, we don't want to do that. The second method is what I call the hindsight method. And this is extremely common with small charities. They say we want to increase our revenue, uh, our income, our charity income by 10% or 5% compared to last year. And because it's a tough time, we want to reduce our costs by 5%. And every year they say revenue up five, income up 5%, cost down by 10%. Well, clearly that's not sustainable because eventually you'll have an infinite of money, amount of money coming in and no cost, which is unrealistic. And it does not take account of the changing environment and opportunities that you might have found out in your SWOT analysis. It's illogical and unsustainable. And managing your business today by looking at what happened last year is, in my opinion, like trying to drive a car by looking in the rear view mirror. Is the affordable method beloved of um, financial directors of my experience and it's would give marketing the money that's left over when we spend everything on everything else in the business in businesses that don't understand the value of marketing marketing is often the poor relation and gets the money that's left over or what they call the affordable method we have a tough year right in the fourth quarter what will we do right we'll stop travel we'll stop meetings we'll stop education and we'll cut marketing because they think that's going to help so that's the affordable method. It's typically seen in organizations that don't understand or recognize the value that marketing brings. This is the method to use, which is what I call the objective and task method. So in the first column, you can see what the objective is, the tasks you're going to need to do to achieve it and the budget you would need. So you can see here for objective one, two, and three, they're proper smart objectives. You can see what you need to do and you can see the budget for each task. Now, if you present a budget like this and the finance director or the board of directors or the chairman decides we're not going to do objective three, that's fine. They, they're not going to spend the last £4,000 for objective three, but they must understand that if they don't spend that £4,000, they're not going to get 5,000 more Facebook pod followers in six months. If they cut objective two, they'll save £3,000 but they're not going to achieve £20,000 of sponsored revenue by having a private high net worth dinner. So objective and task is the one that I commend to you. And I recommend that all, well, all commercial and not-for-profit organisations should use. I won't take any questions now, so I'm getting near the end and I've only got uh, 17 minutes left before you unplug me. So what I'm going to talk about now is the last section of this, which is all about strategy. And in my opinion, it's all about answering the key question. In my experience, strategy is one of the most misused and misunderstood words commonly used in business, commercial or charity. People talk about their personnel strategy and their comm strategy and their fundraising strategy. Everything's a strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, none of those things are strategies. Let me explain what I mean by that. Part of the problem is that there is no clear universally agreed definition of what strategy is so it's not quite surprising that sometimes people don't understand it some think some academics and business people think it's all about writing plans and processes like the SOSTAC model we're talking about today some academics like Henry Mintzberg think strategy is all about being responsive to changes you find in your marketplace with the customer with COVID with competition some people think strategy is all about the products and markets that you sell. Some people think it's about being better and different. And some people think it's about delivering value. Now, no one of those things is a definition of strategy, but yet strategy really should encompass all of those. Because in my opinion, strategy answers the key question. In my experience, most businesses, whether they're commercial or charities, cannot answer the question I'm now about to show you. What is it that makes your organization better and different from your competition in ways that are valued by and add value to your customers or your target stakeholders that can't be easily copied? And most businesses cannot answer that question. That's fact. 
So what I suggest you do, the first action point I would suggest, or the second action point in this briefing, is to discuss the key question with your colleagues. If you think that in stake, um, in Toastmasters, your district, you all have the same opinion of how you would answer that key question, it will be a short meeting, that'd be great. But from my experience, many people in one part of an organization or in the board of directors or in the management team would all answer that question a different way, which basically indicates you're all going in different directions and you're not focusing on the customer wants and needs, which we've described and agreed earlier is the heart of marketing. So strategy is all about how you answer that question. And it'd be interesting to see if in your organization, you would all come up with the same answer. Just that commend that to you. If you don't want to do it, that's fine, but it's quite a valuable exercise. What you've got to do is start with the customer experience you're trying to create and work backwards to what you deliver to make that experience a reality. You can't start with what you have today, what you offer, and then figure out who you're going to try and sell it to. Work has start by thinking about what unique experience are you trying to deliver to the customer? What incredible benefits are you giving the customer? It's not about what you do. It's about what you do for the customer. So take time to think about that. And I'm sure many of you have got this already. Again, I'll skip over questions for now. I'll spend a few minutes now talking about a concept called product markets. And this was a concept invented by an American academic called Igor Ansoff in 1957. And still to this day, it's one of the most successful, most widely used marketing models. And it's got two axes. You think of your existing, ex your existing offerings and your existing markets, new markets for your existing offerings and new offerings. So you've got a two by two matrix of new and existing offerings and new and existing markets. And if you fill in those four quadrants, it basically decides you have four possible strategies. The first one is market penetration. So what can we do to increase the revenue or increase our success of selling our existing products to our existing markets? And I haven't got time today to go through the, the underlying answer to that question, but the first strategy you think of is market penetration. The second strategy is saying, who else can we sell our existing offerings to? We're selling our existing offerings to, let's say, business people or for example, let's suppose Toastmasters, you're marketing your Toastmaster program primarily to people at various stages of their career. You could decide that there's a very attractive market with undergraduate and postgraduate students who could all benefit, in my experience, from the ability to speak more coherently in public. So a Toastmasters offer for students and people in study, schools or uh, universities could be hugely beneficial. You could think, what else could you deliver to people as well as helping them to have the experience of public speaking and giving them training and support and confidence building in that area. And what, if you wanted to do it, is what new offerings could you bring to new markets? And I'll give you an example of this in a charity sense based on the real charity that I work with. It was a charity based in Richmond in Surrey. And what they offered was bereavement counseling to Christian families. And they wondered how they could expand their operation. And the first thing they thought of, well, they could offer bereavement counselling for Christians in other London boroughs. So go and find a new market. Don't just stick in Richmond, Surrey. They could bring out new offers. They could do bereavement counselling for other faiths in Richmond. They're very good for Christian families. They could recruit uh, volunteers or people to do counselling for Muslim or Jewish or Buddhist or uh, humanist families who've suffered a bereavement. And what they finally thought of, which was quite good, I gave them a bit of a nudge in this direction, they could actually just do bereavement counselling training. Rather than doing bereavement counselling for the bereaved families, they could train people generally, and they could be the UK provider of training for bereavement counsellors in social services and local government and everywhere. That's just a model of how it worked in a real situation. One thing they don't teach about the ANSOP matrix is the following. So for each of those areas, you've got four strategies. And what you need to think about, and this is what people often don't do, is work out how much money they could expect to get from segment one, segment two, segment three, segment four. So your total revenue objective is a sum of the money you get in market penetration, plus the money you get from market development, plus the money you get from offer development, plus the money you get from diversification. And again, that's how you actually use the Ansoff matrix is a great sort of conceptual philosophical framework. This is how you use it in a real business sense. And this is often never taught in business schools. And I believe it ought to be. The next thing is express what you do, not in terms of what you believe in, but what you do for the customer. So if you had a charity that 
pure, provided clean drinking water for people in underdeveloped uh, areas of the world, you wouldn't just tell your donors or sponsors or volunteers, hey, come and work with us, we make clean drinking water. What you would say is we improve the health and the hygiene for longer life in countries that are suffering in this area. If you, for example, did public speaking, like Toastmasters does, don't talk about we do public speaking, we have these workshops, we have these events, we have these open days, we have these competitions. Talk about come and work with us and improve your life chances, your income and your family security. Because if somebody's a co coherent and communicative speaker, they're likely to get on faster in their job and be more successful and therefore have benefits for their life chances generally. So that's a benefit for a Toastmaster, if I can put it that. Um, some things that charities offer might be counselling or um, some sort of therapy, CBT therapy, whatever it happens to be, or the stuff that you offer will improve people's mental health. It reduces anxiety and stress, improves their quality of life in social business situations because they're now more confident public speaking. And as you know, public speaking is the number one fear that most people will say when they're interviewed about what frightens them. And finally, if you're giving money for following a... Um, an, uh, uh, a human disaster or famine in a part of the world don't talk about give us money and we'll send food to africa we're changing the chance of a child living where our money will help a child to live help a child to see help a child not to get leprosy or um, whatever the disease is that you're curing so talk about what you do for the beneficiary not what you do and i'm sure you may be already doing that so apologies if i'm speaking to the converted in this area. But believe me, most businesses and many commercial organizations, look at the adverts you see on the TV or in print or in the internet, and look how many times they talk about my what we do, what I, my company does, we make this, I do this, we're the longest standing this, we do this, me, 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 me. And they very rarely, many businesses and certainly many charities, don't talk about the incredible benefits they'll give to the customer, which goes back to what strategy is and the definition of marketing. So for your business, an action I could, you might think of doing, and it's up to you, is take that Ansov matrix model and work through what you're going to do for market penetration, uh, market development, product development, and diversification, and put some numbers and dates and details of what you're going to do to bring out new products or enter new markets. Final section before I wrap up is segmentation. Segmentation is a simple concept that basically recognizes not everybody wants the same thing. People have got different amounts of money, different interests, they read different media, they have different free time. So you need to decide groups of people that are consistent in their wants and needs and you can build different products to satisfy them. So the wants and needs of a Toastmaster client who's retired in their 60s is likely to be different to the wants and needs of a, a student, a potential Toastmaster member or a young person who's just starting out in their career, perhaps with a young family or to somebody in their mid to late forties in middle or senior management. So tailor your offers and make different offers to different groups of the market who want different things. Lots of people talk about this, but in my experience, many businesses and charities in particular just have one vanilla offer and they don't customize it to the wants and needs of different parts of the market and therefore miss opportunities as a result. There's different ways of segmenting the market, geographic, socio-cultural, behavioral, psychographic, and I haven't got time to go into these days. This, this one slide is the sort of subject to about eight hours of lectures I could do. You'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to do them this evening. But basically think about what different customer sets want. So I'll give you an example. Imagine you're a cosmetics company. You might make a cosmetics range for millennials, or 18, uh, age 18 to 25, who are interested in ethically and sustainably sourced cosmetic products. Uh, they're not tested on animals and they've got a limited budget. And you build a different range of products and cosmetics for older consumers who seek a more luxurious and high quality cosmetic product, perhaps aged 45 or above, uh, with a higher than average income and perhaps more leisure time. So again, it's just obvious things which we know about in life is make the product fit the market. Don't make a product then try and find a market to sell it to so again for your um operation if you wanted to do this you could spend some time in the next step of your marketing plan deciding how you're going to segment the market whether it's members or donors or sponsors or volunteers or other stakeholders with, with whom you wish to work and think what specific offers you would develop to best fit the wants and needs of those different stakeholder groups
And that brings me to the end of today's presentation. Look at that, perfect timing. And just to remind you that in the next briefing, I'm going to cover part two of strategy, which continues my discussion of how we're going to get there. And I'll talk about some new marketing concepts. Then I'm going to talk about tactics, actions, and control, the last three steps of the SOS tank model. In conclusion, I'd like to finish with a quote by this gentleman, and this is my famous, my favourite, sorry, British biologist. And if you don't know who it is, this is Charles Darwin, who was the British biologist who discovered and developed the evolution of the species theory. And people think Charles Darwin always used the phrase, it's the survival of the fittest. Well, Charles Darwin never actually used that phrase. What Charles Darwin said is the following. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And it's my contention and my argument that if you do good marketing, then your organization that will survive because it will be the most responsive to change. So it just remains to me, before I go to questions, it's a thank you for your time. I've um, done this presentation probably about 20 or 30 times in the last year to various audiences. And I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, that you this evening, of all of the audiences I presented to, you have been the most recent. So thank you very much for your time. And now I shall take any questions. Thank you very much, Peter. And I, I appreciate the comment about recency. <laughs> I am, however, very aware of time and mm -hmm. we need to be respectful of everyone's uh, time here today. So, yeah. Peter, I would like to thank you. I will share with you the questions that we have received in the chat and then hopefully we can cover those in the next session. As sure. a reminder to everyone, Peter's next session is going to be same time, same place next Thursday at 7 p.m. So be on the lookout for that. And I would also like to acknowledge the presence in the room or virtual room of our district director, Daniel Sanders, immediate past district director, Ger Gerard Mannix, and also our region advisor, Francesco Fedeli. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm going to be quiet for a change, and I would like to hand over to our district director, Daniel Sanders. Daniel. Thank you, Steve. I noticed this is two minutes to go in the official slot. I'd like to thank you, Peter, very much for that uh, wonderful masterclass on marketing. And, and as an academic, I really do appreciate the uh, the criticism that you directed at the naive use of SWOT analysis that really set, set, set me back and think. And I think for us as an organization, it was your very last point that Charles Darwin made that is, is, is really important to us, the um, ability to react to change. I think in particular when the COVID crisis and the lockdown came along for an awful long time, we didn't really respond to that change. We survived it, but we didn't really begin to adapt to take advantage of the change dynamics out there. And so I think it is really important to us as, as a district to, um, to, to um, really do this strategic marketing from, from that point of view to make us much more adaptive to our audience's needs in a very changing and dynamic situation. So once again, I'd like to thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank the team that has helped put this webinar on tonight. And I know there's a lot of work behind the scenes. I know Elizabeth herself has had to do quite a lot of negotiation to bring this to fruition. So from myself, thank you very much, guys. A big round of applause. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think we are bang on time, which is very impressive. And Peter, I thank you very much for that. As I said, we will share the questions that we've received so far. I have just posted in chat a couple of things that may be relevant. Peter, I think I found the correct link on the website for your course on charity marketing. So right. I'm sure many people would like to see that. Can I just say the link is bit.ly uh -huh. forward slash charity marketing. One word, charity with a capital C abutted to marketing with a capital M. So bit.ly forward slash, and then one word, charity marketing with a capital C and a capital M. And that's the abbreviated link that takes you to the place on YouTube where it all is. Thank you, Peter. Bit.ly forward slash. Yeah, that's it. That's the link. That'll take, you. You, to, that'll take you to the 15 videos. Thank you. I very much appreciate that. I also shared something that's published by Toast to Us International about features, benefits, and value, which I think touches on what Peter mentioned earlier.
So it's just for me to say it is now 8.30 in the UK and Ireland. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you once again to our wonderful Zoom team for looking after us. And I very much look forward to seeing you all this time next week, where we get to find out how all these wonderful ideas get implemented. So thank you very much. Have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.